Well, this is the panic attack presentation. Uh, we will be discussing some challenges and improvements issues we found on, on the panic side, right? Uh, first of all, thanks Kernel Recipes organization. Very nice conference. Thanks for the opportunity to talk here. And thanks the attendees, right, for watching me. Uh, I'm Guilherme Piccoli. I work at Igalia, which is a cooperative, worker owned cooperative, focused on uh, open source software. Very nice place. And so, okay, let's start. Uh, here's a bit of the context of the presentation. Uh, all started with uh, Steam OS and uh, necessity of having a panic log collection tool. Uh, SteamOS is an Arch Linux, but I'll go more about this. And then we analyzed the kernel infrastructure available for that, like KDump or PStore, right? And by playing with uh, those tools, we ended up uh, crossing paths with the concept of the panic notifiers. And the panic path is very uh, complex. We have conflicting goals there. And uh, th th that led to a panic notifiers discussion that evolved to a refactor. Also, we are trying to construct this approach here in the presentation. Also, uh, we were talking about some other orthogonal problems, like uh, interrupt storm in, in the panic path, in the K-dump, and graphics on panic, right? So first, a disclaimer. Feel free to interrupt, because I think it's a bit dense topic here. And there might be some assumed or uh, assumed knowledge. I, th I may say something here, not explaining what not. Please ask. Also, we are not discussing the, the KSEC uh, recent problems that are in the list. It's, the, it's a bit trendy, like memory preserving a, across the, the KSEC boots, or the new security technologies like uh, SEV or TDX problems, etc. Right? So here we go. The, the gen is the origin of this work. It always started with this thing deck, which is a very nice hardware from Valve. This is a picture I took myself, so not really great resolution. Uh, it's a very powerful hardware, right? Eight uh, CPUs, uh, 16 gig of RAM, NVMe. And it's a, it's a computer in the end, right? So it has a distro running there. It's a distro based on Arch Linux called SteamOS. And Andre uh, talked uh, to more extent about this yesterday, about the, how it works and, and the Proton layer. So it's a, it's a complex stack to run games. But we have a KDE Plasma if you want to run as desktop, right? And the thing is that Arch Linux has no official KDUM tool. Uh, so uh, it would be beneficial to the Steam Deck community to have some way of collecting blogs during panic time, right? So what blogs we want to collect? Basically, the most we can, right? The, the message, task states, uh, memory information. But we need to be careful with the size of that, because to like uh, send that, imagine, to Val, sending a Vim core is a, bi a bit much. So we want information that uh, we could collect for kernel and hardware debugging, and we want to rely on in-kernel infrastructure for that, not reinventing stuff, right? So how to collect those logs? So we have basically two noun and main mechanisms for that. One is kdump. Kdump works like it's a k-exec, uh, a process of jumping from one kernel to the other, uh, on panic time. And for that, we need to pre-reserve some memory. It's a bit big nowadays, like 200 megabytes or more. And we need to pre-reserve and preload the kernel and interd in this area. So when a panic happens, it jumps to this new order kernel. And there might be some tool in there, like in interd, to collect the memory of the broken kernel. And it's a lot of information. It can collect what we call Vim core, which is a full memory image of the broken kernel. Even compressed, it's, go ahead. Uh, there are enough tools out there where we can reduce the information and where we can actually ex extract only the information you want to. You don't have to, to do a full VM core for that. Oh, yeah. So a K, a K dump is basically the, the technology which allows you to, to, to see the, the whole preserved memory of the previous kernel. Mm -hmm. And then once you figure out where your stuff is, then the tools can help you to collect whatever, the demessage buffer or some state or back uh, stack, stack areas or whatever. So that's, the, yeah, there's tools has... out there. So no need to, no to, need to, to do a full uh, uh, VM core somewhere. 
Yeah, the, the Vim Core is like the most we can collect. Let's say like this, it's the big hammer. We want more information, okay, Vim Core. But if you want to filter that, of course, it's possible. The tool, the main tool is called make them file, right? So it can compress the Vim Core or can extract, for example, a D message of the, from the, this Vim Core. We don't need to save that. But that's not, not the main point here. The point here I want to kind of emph emphasize is that we require reserve a memory for that, right? We need to put an, another kernel. So we have the, the need for the crash kernel parameter and reserve a bunch of memory. So we have the other way of collecting. Let's say we call on, we won't only want a D message. So we have other way to collect that, which is pstore. So pstore works in a different way. It, uh, it can collect a uh, log during the panic time. So uh, notice that kdump is you jump to a new kernel to read data from the broken kernel. pstore is different. It runs in the broken kernel in the panic time. We have multiple front ends for that, like ftrace, console, oops. So for example, ftrace, if you want to, to save uh, ftrace in a persistent area, we can use pstore for that. To our uh, context here, we are interested in oops, the oops front end. And we have multiple back ends for that, which is the persistent storage entity. So we have RAM, we have Uf UFI, ACPI. The RAM one is called RAM oops, so we can save uh, on RAM, right? The question is, is if it's enough amount of information. Having only the message is what we want. We will discuss more about this, but uh, so both tools here, both KDump and pstore, require a user space counterpart. They are uh, kernel mechanisms, right? But you need to set them up. And for KDump, we need to, like, like having a tool to read the Vim core, to compress, to filter, whatever you want. So it requires user space uh, counterpart. Arch Linux does not have it, like, like Debian or Fedora or, or distribution. So we wrote one called KDumps, presenting KDumps here. It's an Arch Linux KDump and pstore tool. It's available on Arch Linux uh, user repository, right? Supports Grub and some init systems. It defaults to pstore. And currently it only uh, uh, works with RAM loops, but we are implementing UFI. It's default uh, used by the Steam Deck and submit logs uh, to Valve. The thing is, Steam Deck has, uh, due to some x86 alignment, some memory is kind of uh, not used there. 16 megabytes not used. It shows as RAM buffer in the IO mem region. So we took opportunity. So we saw that memory there and said, let's try. Let's collect the pstore to this region. And it works because the firmware on Steam Deck does not retrain the memory. So the content is not lost across uh, hot reboots, right? Uh, but we want more information. So we default to pstore because we don't want to like uh, waste 200 megabytes of DEX memory uh, because of KDump, right, uh, reserving memory. So we default to but we want more information. How to achieve that? And one way is to, through this panic print parameter, which shows more information on the message on kernel on panic time. So, so panic print can show test information, memory state, uh, can show back traces for all the other CPUs. But there's one thing, uh, panic print function is called after the pstore. So what happens is what happened, right, was that, that we collected the pstore log and after that, the panic print runs, dump more information, the information is lost, right? So we had an idea, reorder the, this call, right, and call panic print before. So let's talk a bit about the code path in panic. Hmm. This is an oversimplified uh, flow, of course. And first, the panic uh, disable IRQ, disable preemption. We dump stack. If kdump is set, we jump to the crash kzec function and the architectural code that does kzec right up front, uh, the fast we can. If kdump is not set, we disable the secondary CPUs, so only one CPU keeps running. Then we run point quantifiers that we'll talk more about soon. And this key message dump is the infrastructure used by pstore. It's pstore register as a key message dumper, right? After that, we run panic print. And finally, if we set like reboot on panic, we have the architectural code to perform the reboot. So this is the proposal of the code reorder. Just move the panic print on top here. You see crash kzec here, kdump, and we have the, the pstore in the middle. Just put that on top. But the thing is, when we propose that, uh, there's a bunch of discussions. It's, it's risky to do stuff before kdump. Uh, the maintainer of kdump, Baokuan, discussed a bunch of that with me. So they want to do the least as possible, 
So uh, it's not really accepted, and they, we, we propose a less invasive change uh, to move P -store, P, uh, pr uh, the pen prints only before P store, not before KDAV. But then we have a new problem. What they use if the users want panic print uh, before KDAV? Because the core could be too much, so uh, we could uh, people could use the PSTOR, uh, the panic print before, and with that, for, for using that, we needed to run the panic notifiers before KDAV. So let's talk more about how the notifier stuff works. But mm. any, there's another there's another problem. Any print whatever, print, mm. warrant print, emergency or whatever you do mm. in that code pass is with the current um, way how PrintK and the console uh, drivers work is going to be um, risky because uh, most, of the, most of the panic printing to the console drivers actually is based on hope and pray. It's there's no no guarantee that you get the that you get the dump actually out. So even even working the kernel uh, log is risky. Is because no, it depends no, on the no, drive. No, the, the log buffer itself not. Mm -hmm. But the way how print print printing works, it's writes into the log buffer and uh, line by line, and then it dumps it dumps it out to the console drivers line by line. And that's the, one of the major design problems right now. So there's work in progress. John Agnes is working on that in course of the uh, console rework, oh, that's great. which mitigates that. Uh, because you end up, we, we do not even have a notion that some of the console drivers are not mm -hmm. able to be invoked, let's say, in NMI context. Because you then end up printing out one line to serial, then you go to the uh, video frame buffer uh, console device driver, and that dies hard, and you never get mm -hmm. anything out of the machine. That's and that's not unusual, especially not on 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 uh, desktop machines. Yeah. So, so you have to really think about it. What you're doing there? Okay. Well, I mean, that's, that, that's just the second problem. Before, there's a problem before you get there, which is that the print case string might involve print, you, know, you might have to dereference a pointer in order to get there, and we're in panic. So maybe that pointer turns out to be a null pointer, and so we panic before we panic, and now we're mm -hmm. really, yeah, really stuck. It's a risk, yes. Panic, uh, printing is, is really a risk, but the thing is, this is like the context of why we end up working panic with fires. It's not, because of that uh, idea of um, let's try to, to run bank print before KDAMP. We To do that, we need to run the notifiers. But then, uh, notifiers, let's call about, a bit about the notifier. What, what is the concept of notifiers? Notifiers are a very simple concept. It's a list of callbacks that you can register and run your callback in any order. We have like the priority concept to kind of uh, use ordering that, but it's not really used in, in the bank notifiers code. The pen notifiers do not use that. Uh, we have multiple types of callbacks. We can have like a, a notifier chain call of atomic callbacks or blocking ones. The panic notifiers is a, a, a notifier call, uh, a list of callbacks of atomic type. This is an, an example of one of them. It's a very simple one, RCU, right? So it disables the uh, RCU install. And you see that we have this structure here to to register the function and the function uh, atomic notifier chain register that puts that, that function in the list, right, the notifier list. So the panic notifiers, uh, the, the panic notifiers uh, infrastructure is kind of, you can do anything. Anybody can add a function or callback to run on panic time. It's risky for the KDump reliability, but uh, sometimes it could be necessary. And there was a solution for that a parameter called crash KZEC post notifiers. So it's a quite a name, right? It's an all or nothing option. It runs all the notifiers uh, before KDAM. Uh, so we didn't want to run all the notifiers. So we had a middle ground idea. How about a filter? And we can put functions there. We can set, user can select which notifiers to run. So uh, the KDAM maintainers like welcome uh, this feature. They like that, but honestly, it was papering over a real issue here which is that panic notifiers is a no man's land. Anybody can register anything, so it's, it's quite risky. So there was a very good analysis from Peter Mladek, uh, the print key maintainer, 
that exposes the need of a refactor there. So this is the sketch of the, the refactor proposal. While Peter was looking at that, he noticed that we can split the notifiers in more lists, not only one, because there were some patterns. Some notifiers were printing stuff or stopping watchdogs. Others were poking the hypervisor or firmware, right? And others do, like the final one here is the miscellaneous thing. They, they halt the machines, they, they blink LEDs and whatnot. And also we need to order them regarding the KDAM because uh, like some hypervisor poking might be necessary. So this list could make sense to run by default before KDAM. Uh, the information list depends. Maybe the user wants like uh, sets a key message dumper like pstore, so it might be interesting to run that before KDAM or not, depends. And the miscellaneous list, uh, list uh, runs after KDAM, of course. So we submitted a, a V1 uh, more or less one year ago. And I'd like to special thanks here, Peter, for the idea and Baupan, Michael Kelly for the discussion, right? So the first step is to, of this refactor is to fix the current panic notifiers. There are some patterns of problems in the notifiers. So what, uh, if we check the kernel as of today, we have 47 notifiers, most of them in architecture, like dumping castler offsets. So the first thing we, we noticed is that there's a bunch of notifiers that were multi-purpose. They were poking firmware, dumping stuff, and halting the machine after that. So not great, right? So let's decouple them in singular uh, pr purpose notifiers. Also change the ordering. For example, the, the, the halting of a machine should be one of the last things to run, right? Because it's halting the machine. Uh, and disabling watchdogs or uh, even some information once like cause or offset could be run before. So we order some of them. And also we notice that a bunch of notifiers were using regular locks, which is dangerous in, in the panic scenario because we don't have interrupts. We don't have preemption. We disable secondary CPU. So imagine you are waiting on a spin lock or mutex. Who will uh, wait you? I mean, you were waiting there forever, right? No, the other code will not run. So what we do is to use the try lock mechanisms there. If the lock is taken, sorry, you cannot run because, or else we, we die there. So a real example here, the PV panic. PV panic is a small driver, interesting stuff. It pokes the hypervisor if a panic happens. It exposes a virtual PCI device inside a gas, like you remove gas. And uh, you can, if the panic happens, through the, the panic notifier infrastructure, it warns the hypervisor about this. The way it does it, it's the, through this function send event, which is an MMIO write. And it was using spin lock, right? So uh, we changed that to try lock. We, we changed that to try lock. And we order that, running that a bit first, uh, as, as one of the first ones, ASAP, because it's a, a mechanism to, to poke the hypervisor. So then we come to the list splitting after fixing notifiers. Uh, originally it was three lists, but we ended up with four of them. The first one is hypervisors list uh, with the, the functions that poke the, the hypervisor and the firmware, like the PV panic I just mentioned. Hyper-V has a very interesting case here. Uh, power PC, I'll talk more about Hyper-V. Uh, firmware assisted dump in PowerPC. I also put LED blinking here, but it was not a good idea. Uh, it was discussed in the thread because LED is, uh, blink is like the last stuff. If all fails, like we, we blink some LEDs. So we might move that uh, to late lists. Then we have an informal, informational list that dumps information, disables watchdogs, like the RCU and hung task uh, watchdog stuff and F trace dump on oops. Then we have the pre reboot list, which was the miscellaneous one with the halting functions and, and IPMI interfaces notification. The code is quite. Uh, go ahead. Uh, why is disabling watchdogs and whatever uh, informational? No, it's functional. It is. It so, is. so and you really should separate that because you're making the same mistake again. Mm. You just define. Oh, it belongs somewhere there, and instead of saying no, we want to disable all these things which can interfere with panic first, mm -hmm. and then we dump shit. Instead of, oh, we got the priorities wrong. We started dumping shit and then came the watchdog because we failed to turn it off. Yeah, but the thing is, it's on the informational list because we put them on the first of this, in the first positions of this list to this, disable stuff before printing. This is a complete 
go, go back in the history of notifier call chains. The, the, worst, the worst one of all was the CPU hot plug notifiers. This ended up in a total disaster because you never had consistent priorities. Hmm. And people choose priorities and you're not can keep track of them. Nobody is, is paying attention. And you get the new <laughs> notifier somewhere in driver X and it's going to be int max because my driver is the most important one and it doesn't matter at all. And it's hard to review. I understand and I will reach that part because I totally agree with you and I would like to brainstorm here some possibility of centralize the review of the notifiers because what you said is one of the main criticisms of this kind of approach. It's very difficult to review the notifiers code, right? Because it's, it, as you said, it's in some driver. So how, how can it reach people with knowledge on the panic path? It's just confined in that driver. So if you, if you have a way to, like a central list of the panic notifiers that people, if they want to add a panic notifier, if they must put the notifier somehow in this list, we could put the reviews might, to that file. You might look at, at how CPU art plug does. This was a state machine which is basically a, a list of states, and you can mm -hmm. register a particular state, but you have to define the state first. Mm -hmm. Or you can go into a state range where you don't care. So there's a dynamic state range defined mm -hmm. so that you don't have to um, uh, assign a, a state in, in the first place. But that dynamic state range is at a well-defined place within the other states. So mm -hmm. you have explicit ordering instead of random uh, Joe developer chooses a priority ordering. Mm -hmm. Okay, good idea. So that's, that's how we solved it in the hot plug uh, 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 rework. And that worked out pretty well. So we got these dynamic ranges for people who do not care, where you can say, okay, this is the additional dump in range. Mm -hmm. So very where it doesn't matter whether you print the Kostler offset before some other information or the other way around. It doesn't, it, it, that's irrelevant. The important thing is that you get all this information out. But you won't have something like the, the, the watchdog in that range because that's something you say, this needs to be at priority act or in order acts mm -hmm. and to happen before. And those are explicit states and then you have the dynamic ones, and that's how we organized um, hot plug, because then with explicit states, you get explicit ordering, and nobody can work around that. Okay, great. So it's a good suggestion. We can, we can of course, refactor in this way, if it worked, have a, a proof in history, right? So great. Uh, but anyway, we, we continue what we did, right? This is past time. We did already in the V1. So we created a, a fourth list, because there was some hard-coded code in the pent path. Like Spark has code there. There's includes Spark code independent. So it created a final list with, which we called post reboot, which logically is a bit weird, the name, right? So we, there was a suggestion to change this to loop list. So to accommodate this, this code that was hard coded on Panic Path. So we introduced then the notifiers level, uh, which is uh, required to reorder those lists regarding the KDM. So basically, it's a fine grained tuning of which lists we want to run before or after the K-dump. Uh, we allowed full flexibility, which proved to be not a great idea. There were some complaints about this, this uh, excess of flexibility in the panic path. But by default, we set to, to run hypervisors lists first before K-dump by default, and then information list, but only if you have a K-message dumper, which might make sense if the people uh, register something like the store they want data. And this implementation mapped le levels to bits in the list, so it was called like magic in, in the review. <laughs> and we, I mean, we, we, we need to change that in the V2. This work allowed subsequent improvements. One of them, really simple, was to convert the panic, uh, the, uh, the panic print call to a notifier itself in the informational list. It fits there. But uh, the other one, which was very interesting, was to unexport the crash case act post notifiers. This is a parameter, right? But it's exported because some code is forcibly setting that, hard coding that to, to one, forcing this parameter to run. And Hyper-V is one of such cases, and they have some reasons for that, genuine reasons, right? 
The Hyper-V case works like this. They have something called VM, but Hyper-V is the Microsoft uh, hypervisor thing, right, for clarity here. So th this, they have this VM bus connection thing that must be unloaded before the crash case act. So how they accomplish that? In x86, uh, there is a machine ops structure. So we, we, we have like uh, hooks, like crash shutdown. So this runs right before the crash case act starts. So we can put this uh, VM bus connection load there if you want, but ARM 64 has nothing like this. So they are relying on panic notifiers, enforcing test that, forcing set the crash uh, post notifiers because of that, because they want to accomplish the same results in ARM 64 and x86. We started a discussion with ARM maintainers, but uh, it, it seems like unworthy complexity. So it's not a good, a good idea to mimic x86. Oh, <laughs> here's the maintainer, right? So Mark, Mark uh, participated in the discussion, right? So uh, we have no way of uh, doing that in ARM. I don't know what Mark is going to tell us now, but uh, forcing the panic notifiers is what was the last resort for Hyper-V, Mark. Yeah, so I think my opinion, as I tried to state it on the list, which might not have come across clearly here, is that is a result of a few things. One on ARM64, we don't know the history of having PV ops. We don't want them embedded all throughout core code. So that's like one thing that doesn't exist on ARM64. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing here is that the thing that Hyper-V is doing here doesn't need to be done in the first kernel. The disconnecting from the VM bus thing mm. can be done once you're in the crash kernel, which is then going to be much more reliable because you're not relying on the kernel that's panicking to actually undo it. Okay. And therefore, you can just do that in the setup in the crash kernel, and it removes this problem entirely. And also, it's just weird, and it shouldn't be a random magic hook, which I understand is what you're trying to fix, uh -huh. but it works much better with Thomas's approach of we have an explicit order of things rather than trying to have a special hypervisor class, and that was the... Yeah, it was discussing the list, yeah. your idea, like to run early and, in the kit and, and just because x86 has this machine ops uh, ugliness, it's not saying it's a good idea yeah. per se, and the fact that it can hook into it is bad enough, so it should die. Um, so, you know, the, 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 one of the one of these 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 things I observed over time in the kernel with those notifiers and other mm. magic callback mechanisms is that it's so easy to hide things behind that that mm -hmm. you don't see what's really going on. And if you want to make something robust, then you have to have control, and you have to be very explicit and prevent people from abusing the infrastructure. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. I guess uh, I, I, I'm, I'm also seeing that, and I want to make it explicit the best I can. And about running the Hyper-V stuff on, on the beginning of the network, I don't really remember what, what was the outcome of the discussion. I guess uh, Michael said it could be possible, but would need some really work. We can, we could try that. Yeah, course. I think my understanding of what Michael Kelly said on the list was, it is something we could go and take a look into, but he didn't have any interest in actually yeah. doing it. Exactly. So I, I, the only reason I'm saying this is, I just wanted to be clear that it wasn't on ARM64, we had no interest. I think there are better solutions now. Oh yeah, all. definitely. I understood that. And uh, mimicking x86 when the maintainer of x86 said it's ugly, I don't think it's a good idea, right? So my, a new refactor might be remove the machine ops on x86. So okay, pros and cons. Uh, we already heard a, a bunch of cons here about the approach. So uh, there was a good discussion, an exhaustive discussion on the mailing list about that. Uh, a bunch of people commented, was really enriching. And the first of all, we don't really understand what we should uh, run before KDump or after. And one of the reasons is what we were talking here, uh, Thomas, right? Uh, there is no way to guarantee that notifiers will be properly revealed. It can be hidden inside some driver code that uh, register the callback and it will run on panic time, right? So I would like some idea to, to centralize that, uh, that registering and Thomas mentioned hot plug code. So to change that to mimic the hot plug code. So, okay, I'm gonna take a look on that. Less is more because too much flexibility of the levels were not, people really did love that. And there is also, the thing is, notifier releases are reliable in panic path. Because imagine we have a memory corruption that corrupts the list. So what happens then? You jump to another place. Right? You can, if you have a memory corruption somewhere, you end up uh, dumping an information into the into the log buffer and it crashes because exactly. you have memory corruption. So there's nothing you can do about. It. Yeah. That's. It's I mean, either 
the panic situation is something really went bad. So, and if it's caused by memory corruption, then there's no guarantee that you can survive and, and actually get yeah. any information out. So that's, it's inherently, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, it's inherently unreliable, right? Because it's panicky. Depending yeah. on the cause of panic, I agree with that. And, and hard coded calls, calls won't sell. Won't it means you want that. as few instructions as possible in your dead kernel before you get to the crash kernel. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so it's a consensus at least that notifiers are unreliable. So the next steps at v2, just change it after the discussion, right? But originally it was he worked the list as suggested to move some callbacks here and there and split the submission, only the list first, then the refactor part uh, of the KDAMP ordering, and considering ways of improving the pen notifiers reviews. And for this, we might use the hot plug ideas from Thomas here to change this whole uh, thing, right? So this is like an abrupt shift of topics here. It's another part of the presentation. We are gonna talk a, a different problem here. Uh, chaos on KDAMP, basically, Another painful area on the panic uh, cases is the device state on KDAMP. Because in a regular case, Zach, when we jump to another kernel, we have a shutdown callback. So we give drivers a uh, opportunity to quiesce the devices properly. Not always works, but we have that. In crash kernel, is different. We just jump to the new kernel, no matter what the device state is. So we have a real case of an interrupt storm. So the, the original problem was we have an Intel Ethernet card under PCI pass through using uh, IO virtualization, and it was not using the in three drivers, which is the PDK. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right? No, but it's even worse. You'll see that. <laughs> it's, it's even worse. It was using the PDK, and they have a custom tool to poke some registers on the device to collect, uh, to collect statistics. So it's crazy, crazy thing. And in the end, uh, we, we got uh, a problem. It triggered kind of a firmware condition in the network card. And the symptom we debugged was some lockups on host. Host was super unresponsive, have lockups. And by understanding what's going on, it was interrupt storm on that uh, network card. So what we did, we suggested the customer to run a key dump to collect more data. It was a very bad idea. The customer was pissed with that. Because uh, key dump kernel didn't work as well. We could not boot it. It was completely unresponsive. And guess what? Interrupt storms again. So the thing is, the KZAC is a new boot. But it's different from a firmware boot because we don't have a PCI mechanism to reset the devices there on the, this new kernel. x86 especially has no protocol for that, no standard. The root complexes resets are vendor specific. As an example, PowerPC has something like that. They control the hardware. So they have a firmware-aided PCI reset, but x 6 has nothing. So after multiple debugs and attempts and discussions, we came with an idea to clear the device's MSIs on boot. But how to do this if the PCI layer kind of comes later of the problem? So uh, thanks my friend Gavin Shen, he showed me that some infrastructure in x86 to poke PCI really early in boot, x86 early PCI infrastructure, right? So we proposed that three years ago, uh, a clear MSI parameter to go to, to the devices on x86 boots to and clear all the MSIs uh, through this infrastructure, right, the early quick one. And it, it worked. Okay, then boots now, all fine. But then we have some concerns about Bjorn, the PCI maintainer. The first one is that it's limited. It only access the, the first segment or domain, which is the first number in the PCI address. You have four of them. So it's limited in the amount of the devices it can, it can reach. Um, other concerns is that solution is only for x86, right? Might affect other architectures. And, but there was something more. We didn't really understand the precise point of the failure. And thanks to Thomas, we clarified that in another discussion. It was parallel discussion. I jumped there and Thomas explained that and engaged in the discussion, explaining the problem in the interrupt uh, the interrupt, the interrupt flood happens right on the start kernel when the, the x86 enable interrupts. But due to limitations, we, we came, uh, there were some other suggestions that thread, like MSIs are DMA writes, right? So uh, it's related to something called interrupt remapping tables. So uh, IOMU approach was suggested then. How about if you clear such remapping tables 
and the year report in MMU might work, right? So uh, next step could be this one here. Uh, to, to implement that IMU solution, maybe it's too limited, because what if you don't have IMU, right? Uh, we also want to, to maybe investigate other architectures, how's the status there? Go ahead. Um, you should always try to reset the IO or maybe you remapping into a state where it catches these things. And this is pretty independent of the architectures. And that works pretty well. So we should always do that. Just bring it into a state where it shields off everything which is <laughs> not uh, allowed to send interrupts right at the moment. That's what interrupt ray mapping is for, and it's enabled very, very early in boot. Yeah, so it's a good idea, right, to follow this approach instead of the early quirks. Pardon? It's way better to use the IMMU than the early quirks and go through the PCI devices yeah. to clear in every could, And uh, I mean, if there's no IIO MMU, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's stuff you can't solve yeah. because of limitations, but we can do, do it uh, uh, sensibly uh, via the IO MMU if it's available. And to be honest, every modern, more modern hardware CPU, at yeah, least on x86, and I think ORM64 is true as well, has yeah. IO MMUs, right? Essentially, most. Yeah, I tried to use the same argument as, uh, with the ORM, said, oh, it's better to fix at least some PCI devices with early infrastructure, but he didn't buy that, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, and I, and, I, and on, a, on a machine which which has, uh, which doesn't have an IO MMU, you don't have SRI or V either. Yeah, exactly. For so, my case, I MMU would resolve. For this specific case, clearly. Because no, no, it's a not only for your case, and it's, it's, but that's, that's the typical uh, uh, stuff which causes these problems mm -hmm. because you have a totally different programming model than with the regular devices. And if you have a less complex CPU, you're not having the latest 500 gigabit NIC with 10 trillion of, of queues on it. So it's yeah, just, I understand. I mean, keep it pragmatic and, 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 and solve the cases which you can solve. And then if somebody else has a brilliant idea how to solve the rest, fine. If not, yeah. It's not changing anything because we didn't handle it before. Okay, cool. So we have really a next step here, uh, implementing the MMU idea, trying that. But it would be good to reproduce the problem uh, also, to try it. Um, sure. I would like to chime in. Um, mm. In 1998 or 99, I developed um, a small patch which was called KMSG Dump. It was basically the blue screen for Linux. You could scroll on, uh, and consult uh, your, um, DM, uh, your DMSG and uh, send it to a floppy or a print, uh, parallel printer. And I faced a number of the issues that you are mentioning here. I don't know how relevant they are 25 years later, quite honestly, but I prefer just to expose them because maybe it can give you some ideas. Sure. Um, what I figured was exactly the same. You cannot completely stop the hardware, interrupt storms and whatever. And uh, ultimately, it was only on, on a PC, which is, it was uh, supported. Uh, I just uh, exploited the functionality of the BIOS, which allows you to set a pointer to a, a specific location mm. to reset. I think it was made initially for the 286, which ca could not uh, be uh, uh, um, sent back to real mode after protected mode. Mm -hmm. So you would reset the CPU and jump back to a programmed address. Mm. And uh, by using this, uh, I was able to jump back to the early code in the, the boot code in the kernel because I located the dump code uh, there. Um, and uh, the benefit was that uh, during a panic, I would just uh, hard reset the system. You, uh, you output uh, FE on port 64, if I remember, and uh, it would reset everything, all the device and then uh, you restart in your code. So no k-exec, uh, nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the devices were completely reset, and it could uh, even allow me to uh, just uh, call the BIOS again to reinitialize the screen, for example, mm -hmm. because the machine was resetting, in fact. Nice. So I, I'm pretty sure a lot of this is not exploitable anymore, but maybe there are 
some uh, some pieces of this which could be helpful i don't know cool okay yeah we can talk more later and you can show me that it's interesting to read that okay okay i have some few time here Yeah, this is really quick. I just wanted to caveat the IMMU discussion. Uh, on ARM64, the interrupt remapping is not done by the IMMU. It's done by a separate piece of IP, more closely tied with the interrupt controller. So if mm -hmm. you do go down this suggestion, it'll mm -hmm. need to be at a higher level than the IMMU subsystem. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. So let me quickly finish here. Uh, we have only one more topic to, to talk here, very simple one, graphics on panic. No, joke, it's not simple, it's, it's complex, but I'll be really short here. So uh, GPUs are very complex, and we have a very limited uh, scenario on Panic, right? So have a graphics there, a graphics that is very challenging. Uh, there is no reliable way to do this. Some other OSs have that, like the Windows Blue Screen and whatnot. It would be great to have it. Uh, so I try that in the KDump specific scenario, and by preserving the, the frame buffer, uh, we could make it work. So if we only use the frame buffer, not defer to the, the, the GPU driver like AMD GPU or Intel, it works. Because the frame buffer is just an error of memory. You write stuff, right? So you keep it um, between the regular kernel and the KDump kernel. You can print stuff in the KDump kernel. So I started with discussion about this. How it would be trivial or simple to restore the frame buffer in the, the KDump. And not simple, right? Because once the GPU driver takes over, the hardware is fully reprogrammed. So we need to like program back to the, uh, the the frame buffer, the display to the frame buffer way again. Uh, some UFI drivers do that; they call GOP drivers. Uh, so okay, it's a bit difficult problem. So there are some approaches recently about that. Uh, Noralf came with something four years ago to iterate uh, on available frame buffers, and recently, last week, we have a proposal from Jocelyn. Uh, community seems to be embracing that, which. Uh, for now, it only works in simple DRM. It's an API to get uh, frame buffer information. Uh, but anyway, it's risky to, to try to print stuff during the panic uh, time. So I came up with a different approach here. Uh, firmware notification mechanism. What about if we, instead of printing stuff in panic, we just inform somehow the firmware and defer that to, next, to the next boot to, to show the information of when it happened. Right, so the idea is the UFI panic notification, which is a panic notifier that only sets a variable. So the variable is there, means there is a panic. If we control the firmware, like for example in Steam Deck, we can change the boot logo to, to something like a uh, machine panic, but we are recovering or something like that. It's simple, it's flexible, uh, it's a different orthogonal idea uh, than printing stuff on panic. The, the maintainer was not really convinced because Ard said, uh, we have pstore already. So having the message on UFI means a panic happen. so, happened, right? So we could use this information to infer a panic happened. But I disagree a bit. I think they are orthogonal. Uh, pstore is one thing, and this mechanism to just write a variable is a different thing. We might have limited space on UFI. Uh, the question of the message privacy, the user does not want to collect the message, but wants the, the panic notification. So anyway, the next steps here is to maybe implement that in some form of prototype. And that's it. Basically, it was a long path from starting with the Steam Deck, right? Gaming and coming through the Panic Notifier Refactor. Uh, everything in Panic is polemic, as we see here, right? We have uh, a, many, uh, a long road ahead on this Refactor thing. Uh, QuiS on Crash KZEC is also a very complex area and interesting, in my opinion, for researching multiple architecture fronts. Uh, and finally, graphics on Panic, uh, it's on early stages. Hopefully, Jocelyn's patch came in, got some traction. And, but the UFI approach is something, I mean, uh, it's orthogonal, but it's simpler, right? And that's it, thanks a lot. Feel free to reach me in IRC. I'm typically there. Uh, that's it, thanks. <laughs>